nervous? Yes. First time. No, I've been nervous lots of times. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and congratulations on tuning in. We're so happy you're here. At the end of today's show, we're handing you an honorary participation trophy. It's a special day here because today is the anniversary of the first color TV demonstration, an achievement that saved society from books. To talk more about achievement and how you can better savor yours, we welcome the author of Friction, Soon You. For our TikTok Minute, we learn how HR tricks you into accepting a lower salary. And in our headlines, we'll share a horror story for people making social security decisions. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to Jake. And then I'll bring you my amazing world of colorful trivia. And now, two guys who will help you rock your financial achievements, Joe and O J J J J G. And achieve we shall here on a Monday morning. Welcome back, everybody, to the Stacking Benjamin Show. You found us. You are here. Put your feet up. Relax, because we've got an hour of financial entertainment for you. And the most entertaining person on this podcast, sitting across the table from me, is Mr. OG. In every way, shape, and form, am I the most entertaining person here? What the f***? Are you kidding me? You said that right in front of me with me in the room. As you're chowing down a box of, you know, Fritos or whatever it is that you have. Which makes me more entertaining. Very professional podcasting. We got a great show today. We've got Soon Yu here, the author of the phenomenal book Friction. Turns out, OG, sometimes having some friction in your life, like we just experienced with Doug there. Sometimes having some friction in your life is a good thing. And we're going to talk about applying friction in the right way. But even before that... Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Disturbing headline today, OG, comes to us from Investment News. This is written by Mary Beth Franklin. Beware of incorrect advice about claiming Social Security benefits. You've seen this before where people are getting ready to make their Social Security decision. Maybe they're getting ready to make a pension decision. One of these irrevocable decisions And they are given advice that is patently wrong. However, listen to this one. Mary Beth writes, Social Security Administration field offices were closed for more than two years during the pandemic. Most of the 60,000 employees work remotely, dispensing advice by phone or online. Although the Social Security Administration reopened its more than 1,200 field offices to the public in April, still a huge backlog of unfinished business and frustratingly, some faulty guidance being provided by well-meaning the ill-informed agency representatives. Turns out there's some people at the Social Security Administration, OG, who are giving uh, people the suboptimal... Don't exactly know what they're talking about. Suboptimal advice, don't know a lot. But something like Social Security, there's a lot to dig into, especially, I know, if your spouse has passed away, if you're remarried, there are a number of scenarios that can make Social Security a little bit more of a puzzle than we might want it to be. This is almost one of those ones where it makes sense, especially if you're calling the Social Security Administration, to call a couple of times. Ask the Hang same up, question like to somebody the else. Answer, ask the same question a different time. And uh, when they say, sir, you've called according to our records seven times. And by our accounts, everyone has told you the same story. Then you're like, okay, now I can trust you. I mean, this is, you know, a good planner would help with this, obviously, making sure that you evaluate all the choices. Um, I see the biggest thing with social security are benefits missed, you know, like widowed benefits or, or yeah. something like that. Like they just don't know that they're eligible for them. And you can go back in time and get some of those dollars back. You know, you can say, well, I didn't know I was eligible for them. And, Did and you have that happen with a family member. Well, I, I, yeah, there is some, some drama going on in the OG household, not immediate household, but extended extended family as it relates to Social Security. But it involves the 
you know, the remarriage and benefits of the new spouse versus the lifetime or the total household benefits because he has, you know, his his uh, ex-wife and other kids and grandkids like kind of latched onto his social security because of health issues and stuff. So there are some kind of like maxing out issues that, that uh, came up and knowing the hierarchy of that, you know, I think is really important. The, the, the current spouse wins, <laughs> you know, the ex spouse gets second and then the kids and grandkids go down the list. And, and so that's what happened was when the current spouse uh, uh, filed for her benefit, which was rightfully hers to do so, then that impacted the kind of benefits downstream, so to speak. Oh. And I don't think anybody mentioned it to anybody. It was just, yeah, you're eligible for this money. So press hard, three copies, and click this button on the internet. And boom, we'll send you a thousand bucks a month. Not, hey, we'll send you a thousand, but that thousand's coming out of your grandkids' accounts that you, you know, it wasn't, uh, wasn't really thoroughly explained. Right now, with in- inflation as high as it is, and everybody needs to get every dollar they can possibly get, right? If you're eligible for it, you want to make sure you get every dollar. When's, when's the right time to start getting educated on Social Security? I mean, for most of us, we think about it as a benefit that we're going to start thinking about, you know, after we hit 62. Yeah. I happen to think that Social Security is a pretty decent payoff if you do the math on it over a long period of time. Obviously, I would much rather, given the choice, take my own 7.65% or 62 if you take out Medicare and take my own 62 and and invest it. I mean... The solution to Social Security is make everybody put their 6.2% in a TSP that you can't touch until you're 65. You know, just like that's the solution to Social Security, but that'll never pass. What's a TSP? So a TSP is just a government-sponsored 401k plan. It's just really simple, and it's got, you know, four or five different base options and then some crappy target date funds, but four or five base options that are super, you know, it's like you, it's very hard to screw up. It's not full of costs. It's not uh, plumped up with expenses and people getting their grubby fingers in there is pretty simplistic. It's what we use for our military and, of course, for our Congress people, which we would know they wouldn't uh, stand for anything less than the best. So that would be the solution to Social Security. But, you know, if you have the opportunity to look at your Social Security statement every year, I think you have to be aware of it every year. You should log in every year to your Social Security website, ssa.gov, and make sure that what you are being told about you matches what you expect to have been told about you. Because that earnings history is really important because you're going to base your benefits on your top 35 years. So, you know, if they miss a couple of years or if it gets followed up or your taxes are delayed or something like that, you know, that really matters. But from a uh, from a claiming standpoint, yeah, as you get kind of closer to your late fifties, that's when you start thinking about from a cash flow perspective, how are you going to, you know, when's the right time to take this? A lot of people like to take it as soon as they can. And I think that the vast majority of people would be much more, um, be much more beneficial for the vast majority of people to wait until they're 70. I like the idea of calling back the social security administration and making sure that you, that you get an answer that's correct, especially because of the fact that once you lock in those benefits, they're, they are pretty locked in. Uh, Mary Beth Franklin, who wrote this piece, which we'll link to on our show notes page at Stacking Benjamins, even as a personal story where she had an issue with her benefit claiming strategy and the advice she was given. A lot of times, well-meaning people and very smart people, OG, will give us advice. And it turns out that the so-called expert might not know everything. I found yeah. this list of some of the things, that some of the... Uh, calls the experts made where they were wrong. Uh, How about this one? In 1943, Thomas Watson, you know, Thomas Watson, president of IBM, famously said, I think there's a world market for maybe five computers that nobody's going to want a computer at home ever. I think I have five in my house. (laughs) I know. That's that's what I was. I've I've got three sitting within, (laughs) sitting within three feet of me right now. Yeah. Amazing. Another one on this list, television. The executive president at 20th Century Fox, Daryl Zanuck, who had more than 100 movies to his name when television sets began to become more popular. 1946 interview, he said, television won't be able to hold on to any market it captures after the first six months. People will quickly get tired of staring at a plywood box every night. That's why we don't have plywood anymore with our television. So say you should see the 8,000 pixel LED that I've got hanging in my bedroom. <laughs> I could stare at that for hours, and I do. 
more than 1.4 billion households across the globe have at least one TV set. Just think about that. That's the interesting stat out of all of that. 1.5 billion, you said? 1.4, yeah. So there's roughly six and a half billion. There's four times as many people who don't have televisions that do. That's the, that's the earth shattering stat of the day. Holy crap. And I've got four in my house. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, that stat doesn't add up to me. I'd like to fact check that later. Something doesn't seem right. Cause I realize there's a huge percentage of the world that is, you know, not, I'll say lesser developed nations, but when so much of the world has four and five TVs in their home, in their house or in their, even their uh, small apartments, it seems like that's going to balance out that stat. Something well, no, 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 right. total TVs is households. It isn't total TVs. It's 1.4 oh. billion households have at least one TV. Oh, okay. But, but more important than TV would be internet. Yes. You know, and getting connectivity to everybody, I think. And, you know, I think that number of cell phones is probably significantly higher than that. I mean, and when you hold your phone like six inches away from your face, it feels like a 65 inch television. <laughs> so who needs a TV? Not that flip phone that you have. When most people hold their phones away from their face. Speaking of uh, telephones, William Henry Priest in the 1890s said the Americans may have need of a telephone. We do not. We have plenty of messenger boys. Because we have messenger boys, we don't need we don't need a telephone. Why do you think I came to work here? Thank you, kind yeah. sir. I will not need a device to transmit <laughs> my voice. I came to work here because my job as a messenger boy got eliminated. I have plenty of messengers, and when they failed, the pigeons. Nineteen oh three, Henry Ford asked his lawyer Horace Rackham to invest in his automobile company, and uh, Rackham said, "The horse is here to stay. The automobile is only a novelty." That's why we take horses everywhere to work. Communication silos won't be a thing. Anyway, I'll link to link to I these. I did see a commercial the other day. I don't remember what it was for, but it was a commercial. Oh, it was Great Wolf Lodge commercial. Whatever. Anyways, they were all they, they like all were riding big giant wolves. You know, to like drop the kids off at school and pick the kids up. They got you know instead of getting on horseback, they got on this wolf, and then they all met. You know, the get your get your pack together, and then here is the you know, on the horizon was Great Wolf Lodge, you know, but, uh, but I was thinking about that. I was like, could you imagine if you could do that? That would be cool. Like have a wolf the size of like a big dinosaur. Okay. Either, and then you either you it. dropped acid before you were watching TV <laughs> that day or the ad agency did before they made that. They missed the mark. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm telling you, that's what it was. Look like, it up. Like none of those sentences made sense. Oh, you it was just awesome. spoke. I, well, I did think I was like, how do you train a wolf that big? Because I mean, you definitely look like dinner to them. But little treats. That was that was beyond my comprehension at the moment. I was like, yeah, I'm sure someone figured it out. Okay, I'll go along. I'll follow this commercial. Giant wolves. Okay. I don't know how to follow giant wolves other than to say, hey, let's do our TikTok minute. <laughs> how about that? Where, where do you go after giant wolves? I have no idea. Uh, today's TikTok minute, we're talking about HR, OG. And in this case, a, a woman who used to work in HR who talks about sneaky hiring tricks people in, in HR use to get you to accept a lower salary. Let's listen in subtle and sneaky trick that a lot of HR professionals and recruiters use to pay people less money for the job that they take and I'm going to tell you what it is. The reason I know about this is because I've hired hundreds of people and I've seen this work. When they go to give you an offer, they'll say this. Our whole team was really impressed with you and we hope that you join. It looks like your experience level puts you at the highest end of this salary band or at the lowest end of the next salary band up. So we could bring you in at the higher band, but you would be on the very bottom of that totem pole. Over time you'll be anchored to that band so it's really much better for you to be at the very top end of the total pool do not believe them plus you're a super high performer and it's really clear to us that within six to twelve months you have a good chance of earning that next bump they are actively trying to get you to join for ten or more thousand dollars less how about that huh you, you got a choice of two bands og you could be the bottom rung of this band or the top rung of the lower band. let's bring you in at the lower band i know it's going to be a little less six months from now you can get bumped up It'll be great. Be great for everybody. Especially the people in charge of the money. Right. <laughs> Good for everybody except you. How about that? A TikTok minute that actually made sense. There we go. Good stuff. What are we supposed to do with that? 
What like what was your hope that we were going to discuss here, Joe? Nothing. What was whose hope? Moving along. Moving along. <laughs> There's a reason he played that TikTok minute. We got to talk about it. That was the reason. It was good advice. It was good advice. Moving along. Chop, chop. I think at a time when everybody is uh, worried about getting the next job, and there's so many job opportunities out there, it is uh, high time to know what's going on across the table from you. Coming up next, Soon Yu is an amazing master of, of design who's worked with so many different brands like North Face, Vans, Timberland, and Supreme. As the Global VP of Innovation and Corporate Officer at VF Corporation, he commercialized a $2 billion innovation pipeline established three global innovation centers and initiated industry leading designs and innovation best practices. Of course, he has uh, won tons of awards for advertising, promotion, product. And uh, he's a guy that knows that actually applying a little bit of friction in the right places makes things better. How? We'll have soon you coming up in just a minute. But before that, I think we got some trivia, Doug. Yeah, yeah, I got, I've got trivia. Oh, do you want it now? No. No. Okay, I'll wait. Let me know. It's just, it's all queued up. It's ready to go, but I'm just waiting for that, the, the sign. Oh, there's the sign. There's that one magic finger. Here we go. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Man, everyone is hating on my participation trophies. What? I mean, can a man feel a little better with some cast resin painted to look like precious metal? Yeah, that's it. I'm taking them all away. Speaking of precious metal, let's talk about television. While the original television set was invented in 1541 by a guy named Steve Bubinski, yeah, hence the name BoobTube, look it up, it's totally true, it was today in 1929 that the first color TV was demonstrated. That's why today is the first day we're doing our podcast in color. It's going to take you a few minutes to adjust. Don't be afraid. Joe's always been that red. He, he just has. Just There's medication. Let it go. Though color was demoed in 1929, it didn't hit the networks until 1951. So my question is, that year, which of the major networks broadcast something in color? This Pride, everyone's coming through for the Trevor Project on YouTube Shorts. Join us! Create a short showing how you're stepping up for Pride using the hashtag YouTube Pride Challenge. Come through for Pride on YouTube Shorts. Visit youtube.com backslash pride. This episode is brought to you by La Quinta by Wyndham. Here you are, miles from home and ready to start your vacation. Good thing you're staying at La Quinta by Wyndham. They have free high-speed Wi-Fi to stream all your favorite movies. And in the morning... Get fresh waffles with their free bright side breakfast. Or squeeze in a workout at their fitness center. Either way, you're ready to conquer the day. Tonight, La Quinta. Tomorrow, you triumph. Book your stay at LQ.com. Hey there, stackers. I'm Boob Tube Rube, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. According to historyofinformation.com, the first color programming, a musical variety special titled Premiere, couldn't even be seen on black and white TVs, but the network estimated the views at 40,000. So which network was it that first broadcast a show in color? CBS. Now to help you add some color to your life, soon you. And I'm so excited to introduce this next guest. Soon you joins us. How are you, man? I am doing well. It's uh, good to see you, even if you're in a hotel room. <laughs> I know, right? I'm at a Holiday Inn Express. You know, I may be a nobody soon you, but I've stayed at a Holiday Inn Express. So that's that's pretty amazing. Hey, yeah, it helps your memory. It makes you a super person. I love the ad. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, and what's interesting and where this actually intersects your work, it's funny, I was thinking about this, even as we're joking about Holiday Inn Express is how they've made that like a meaningful joke, right? Hey, I've stayed at Holiday Inn Express. It's really cool. And you're a guy that for a long, long time has been interested in design. I'm passionately interested in design because I feel like, when I take the time to design a better life, things go better. When if I just wake up in the morning and let the day take me, it doesn't. So I, I love where this meets the average person. But you've got kind of a counter argument to what we usually hear soon, which is, 
you know, with our podcast, I try to make our podcast as frictionless for the listener as possible, make it easy for them to get into the, the ideas that we're presenting. When I was a financial planner, which I haven't been in a long time, my goal was to help people learn to save money more friction, you know, make that more frictionless so that people could more easily do things. But you say that maybe we go too far with this, that maybe friction is actually a good thing. Yes, actually, it's so funny. And I didn't really understand that concept until I started to do exactly that. You know, I'm a brand nerd. I started researching these great brands and I started realizing that the great brands are actually the ones that make you think, make you consider them, make you actually intentionally make choices around, you know, designing your life so that you can actually accommodate them and embrace them and fall in love with them. Falling in love is not frictionless. It's actually quite full of friction, right? When I came to that realization, I realized that, hey, there's a lot of bad friction out there. And, you know, to your point, you don't want to make it so hard for your guests to get on and, you know, they can't connect to the Internet or whatever. That platform doesn't work or the mic's not, you know, you want to get rid of stuff like that. But then there's also a lot of good friction. If you listen to your podcast, they're all full of good friction. You are, one, engaging with your audience. You're engaging with your guests. You're asking them probing, insightful questions where they're, quite frankly, sometimes they're prepared for, sometimes they're not. And sometimes your best interactions are the ones where either they're not prepared and they kind of say something that was kind of new for them. Or quite frankly, where they've been, vul- they are actually being vulnerable with you and open up about something that they they may may not have in the past. And likewise, I bet some of your best interactions were when you were actually a little more vulnerable, a little more exposed. And and the audience actually, even if it's over the airwaves, I think they can still feel that uh, what I call good friction of of interaction and of spontaneity and uh, uh, and of authenticity that only happens when it's not rehearsed or practiced or or poised, so to speak. Well, well, and it's funny, Sue, because you make the point, this even goes into my breakfast food. You talk about, you know, since since I was young, my mom was making me pancakes and using Bisquick. Like adding a little bit of friction to my Bisquick, you said, actually is a key component of this thing. Can you, can you talk about this? Because this friction addition kind of blew my mind. Yeah, so what happened is way back, I think it was the 1950s, Pre-1950s, people actually, when they wanted to have a cake, they either went to a bakery and paid for it or most homemakers at home. And, you know, back then it was probably the moms, not the dads. Okay, we're talking about the 1940s, right? Um, Actually had to, you know, spend a lot of time baking a cake. You know, they had to get the eggs. They had to do the flour. They had to do the whatever else, you know, sugar and and everything else they had put in there, right? And um, it was quite a process. Well, Pillsbury came up with the instant cake mix where all you did literally is add water. And for at first, there was some novelty and it sold. But after a time, it actually the sales fell flat and, and they had a hard time to grow in the sales. And they did some research. And it's so funny, even though that even though they made the idea of baking a cake frictionless or seamless or easy as heck, what happened is that the homemakers felt kind of guilty. They felt like, you know what? What I'm serving to my kids and to, to my family, I hardly put any effort into that. And I feel kind of like the cake, it symbolizes this idea of how much I love, you know, how much I give in terms of love to my family. And if all I'm doing is adding water and throwing it in the oven, it just doesn't feel like a real strong expression of my love. And so uh, Pillsbury took that information and they went back and, and they did a little research and they realized, you know, to make it more authentic, to make it feel more homemade, Let's just take out one step. Let's take out the, the dry powder egg mix and actually ask the consumers to just add two eggs into the mix. Just by doing that, it brought all the so-called love, the nostalgia, the meaning of baking a cake back into that process. And the sales skyrocketed just by adding two eggs. That's, that's so powerful. Well, and also you point out the exercise, right? Exercise feels horrible when you are just starting out to exercise, but that friction, that friction of exercising ends up giving you, you know, I'm a runner. I have runner's high, which is an awesome feeling when you get, when you do that. But the friction is what makes us healthier. It does. I mean, we're talking about, you're talking about endorphins, right? Endorphins are kind yeah. of what gives you the 26 mile on that marathon, right? It, it kicks in. It's kind of like that instant painkiller and you can't get that. Unless you reach the point where your body is saying, hey, you know, you need that little bit of extra boost. And in fact, 
talking about the idea of these so-called chemicals, I call them the happy chemicals, almost none of them are, are, can be generated without some degree of friction. We're talking about dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins, and adrenaline. So you think about dopamine. What is dopamine? It is the what I call the reward mechanism. It is the um, anticipation drug. It's, it's the idea not of of actually getting the reward. It's the anticipation that you might get the reward and or the anticipation that you're going to go on vacation. In fact, most people talk about that the start of your vacation happens when you start planning it, right? That your mind starts going there because all those dopamines start kicking in. Well, look, if you make everything too easy and there's no anticipation, you know, and there's no weight, <laughs> there's no so-called being um, – force to sort of, you know, uh, want something or desire something, then there's no dopamine. And so all of a sudden you don't get that happy boost of dopamine. And then oxytocin, oxytocin well, wait a minute. Before you get about- to oxytocin, Before you get to oxytocin yeah. soon, can I ask you a question about dopamine for a second? Because as you're talking, I'm thinking about, you know, a lot of times people have trouble making good buying decisions. You know, we live in this consumeristic society where we just buy more and more stuff. And of course we get this flood of advertising and to your point earlier, the lack of friction in buying makes it easy. I mean, Amazon has just one click buying <laughs> where I can <laughs> very quickly get it. But you're saying with dopamine and probably I'm going to imagine where we're going next is going to be, you're saying we can manipulate these to maybe make better buying decisions. We can draw out the process for ourselves so that the dopamine hit is bigger and maybe more meaningful. Yeah, I think you're actually on to something. And I know you do a lot on like financials and helping people think about making better decisions for their livelihood and, and for their futures. Well, here's a double whammy that happens by your point, which is maybe we spend a little more time instead of just automatically purchasing the something the, the item that says it's Amazon recommended and it's five star. In fact, a lot of those Amazon recommended items, they're not always the best, right? They they, they may have the best what I call uh, trade-off in terms of, of what I call what you're going to buy and what you get. But it may not actually be the best thing for you. And by just spending maybe a day doing a little bit of research, a couple things happen. You may or may end up with the same thing. Fine. But you may not. You actually may end up with something better. Two, if it's not something you need tomorrow, then you're actually a little smarter about the product, the product features, how it might better fit with what your needs are. So you've done some research and – Ideally, that's probably going to lead to hopefully a better selection of the type of products that better fit your needs. The, th- the third thing that happens, and I was second, maybe there's only two things, there's actually three things that happen, is that you get a dopamine high because you're being forced to actually wait to actually purchase that item. My, my wife, I don't buy cars that often, but that is the thing I love to, you know, if I could, you know, sell my, a used car and buy a used car. And I take sometimes two years researching the same car over and over because for me, it's a form of entertainment. (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. Dopamine actually is something where you can self-generate it. And while generating it, you get smarter and maybe you actually end up with a better purchase than just the auto auto button in Amazon about what Amazon recommends. I find the research that you put into all the chemicals – involved in the manipulation of your chemicals to build some friction and make better decisions. So interesting, but you were moving on to oxytocin, which is another big one. Yeah. It's kind of, they call it kind of the love drug. It actually happens when babies are first born and they're held by their mothers and fathers. You get a boost of oxytocin, both for the parents, but also for the baby. And it happens with that warmth, that physical contact. And some of that is very physical. And of course that requires a lot of friction, but a lot of it is just the idea of social interaction. Now, you get a little bit of it in a Zoom call. There's no question, you know, if, if you hadn't seen people's faces in forever and you see them on a Zoom call, there is an oxytocin hit. But it's quite a different oxytocin hit when you actually see them in person after yeah. two years, you know. Yeah. That's why they had those um, – remember those shower curtains that people uh, – those plastic curtains that people actually hugged each other with during the pandemic? <laughs> No, why did they really? Do that? Yeah, but you know when when people wanted to visit, let's say their grandparents at one of the daycare homes, they actually set up plastic curtains. They called them hug curtains, where you could go and actually hug your grandparents through a plastic uh, curtain. And the main reason is because it generated tons of oxytocin, even though it was through a plastic curtain. By just having that physical touch, being embraced. 
uh, by somebody who you love. And, and do you and know so, what's funny, Sue? Yeah, oxytocin is hard friction. Soon that feels good just thinking about it. Mm-hmm. Like just imagining these people that don't get to see each other actually hug, even with a curtain in the way. To me, I'm getting a little oxytocin hit. I think just just imagining that. Yeah, you know the the physical contact is so important in our lives, and you know I, I encourage us not to rely too much on the digital world. I would say let it supplement. You know, let it provide convenience as an optionality. But maybe your first option is what the hell? Let's get in the car drive to go visit you know our grandparents and say hello and have a conversation and sometimes even have the awkward silent moments of not knowing what to say trust me there are different types of chemicals that get elicited by us just being in the room with somebody there's a certain degree of chemistry uh candor a warmth that happens only when you're in person you talk about uh, uh, several different key points throughout the book where you give people tactics. And one of the tactics that I want to talk about when you talk about oxytocin is meaning, right? That that hug gives you meaning and you feel this meaning. And in good design, you're employing more meaning. But you you launch into a great discussion about how they make coffee in Morocco, and, and about how this is not like going to Starbucks and, and being in the drive through This is going to be a little more involved. Absolutely. It happens in um, Moroccan society. It happens actually in ancient Chinese society. It's the process of making tea. But what it really is, it's the process of respecting uh, the traditions and the routines of the people that taught you that. So oftentimes it was your parents and their parents and their parents and their parents. And so in many ways, it's actually respecting the traditions of your ancestors and of your ancestry and of your culture. And, you know, I describe it in the book, but the process takes like 10, 20 minutes to actually make the actual Moroccan coffee. And same thing with the the Chinese coffee, they call it the old man's coffee. But it's a process of not only brewing, you actually there's a ritual around how you warm up the actual teapot, how you use the first pour as the soul of the actual tea um, that you actually then pour back in later. Anyway, there's this entire process and ritual. But the main thing about it is also it is a way of interacting with your guests. Obviously, while you're doing all that, you either are if it's their first time, you're explaining the meaning of everything you're doing, and so it's a way for your guests to learn about you, your traditions, what's important about your culture. And it's also a way for you to connect with your guests because you're spending 15, 20 minutes making something. Now, think about it from your guest point of view. One, they're being enlightened. Um, They're being entertained, right? And then the other thing that when they drink that cup of tea after 20 minutes, they understand all the effort that was put behind it. So that cup of tea is so much more meaningful than throwing a little sachet into a cup and pouring hot water and being handed to you. You know the love, the effort, the attention, and the traditions that actually went into that one cup of tea that is being presented to you. In Japan, what they actually have is not just the tea itself, but they serve it in cups that are oftentimes over 2,000 years old. Wow. And the, or, or I want to call them the clay mugs, and they're beautiful. And what they serve them are, are basically – they're like artifacts, right? And I asked one time how much this would cost if I was trying to purchase the actual mug. And they said, oh, that would probably be about 8000 US dollars. And this is back when I was – you know, this is 20 years ago. I can't imagine what it is now. Imagine drinking from a clay artifact that's worth $8,000 and the meaning wow. behind that. So, yes – Meaning is this idea that, you know, it takes investment, it takes effort, it takes attention, it takes a little bit of storytelling and ritual. And it's so funny, humans are probably one of the most interesting species in this entire planet. We can create meaning out of nothing (laughs) by the mere fact of the story we attach to an object, right? I'll give you a very simple example. I don't want to run overtime with you. That's all right. This is great stuff. And then I have... So pretend, okay, imagine if I had two pens in my hand. One was a big pen, and the other was a Mont Blanc pen. And, you know, I wrote a book that's all about, you know, how to build iconic brands, and Mont Blanc is very iconic, right? And I always ask the audience, hey, which of these two pens are more meaningful and which are more iconic? And everyone obviously says the Mont Blanc pen. And I go, well, hang on. 
Let me tell you a story about this little big pen here. You look at it, it's kind of scruffed up, and it's 16 years old. And guess what? I only use it once a year, and so does my wife. We use it to write anniversary cards to each other every single year. You see, this is the pen that the Justice of Peace gave to us when I forgot to bring a writing instrument to sign our marriage certificate. So then I ask you again, which of these pens are more meaningful and which are more iconic to me? Of course, everyone points at the big pen, and then here's the big catch. Joe, I just made that whole story up. (laughs) It's not even true. (laughs) You had me. (laughs) Uh And that's the power of two things, storytelling and effort and, and the history and tradition that went into something and the fact that us humans, we can make meaning out of nothing. <laughs> well, there's so many. And what was the line of clothing that did that? And Elaine on Seinfeld worked for the brand, the one where they uh, there's people yelling at their device right now, you know, where they do all the storytelling around the clothing and they talk about, you know, this was worn on the old West and, and they would uh, have all of this, all of this stuff. And it just, by the way, and I, and I won't get it here, but it makes me think that obviously when I read storytelling in a brand, there's got to be a little weight there. You want to apply a little friction before you just completely buy into it. But there's a second thing that I think is also really powerful soon, which is, you know, in my life, I can go out to dinner at a restaurant with friends or we can cook together Uh and cooking together is, is less expensive. It's way cheaper. It's going to take forever though. Right. But it is so much more fun. It's so much more meaningful to cook with people and to have this shared experience. And yet we're applying a lot of friction when we decide we're going to take an hour to an hour and a half to cook our meal together. Yeah, you nailed it. I mean, that's such a great way to elicit oxytocin. Um, I think of it as this way. So funny. Your favorite restaurant actually may make whatever dish you and your friends are creating better from an empirical sense, right? Like if you were to have a food critic taste what you guys created versus what the restaurant created, fine. The restaurant might win out. But when you eat what you and your friends created, it just tastes so much better, right? Because you know what went behind it. You know the effort, the energy, the conversation, the laughs, the, the ribbing, the, the mistakes, right? The recovery that you had to do once you had the mistakes, right? That went into that prep of that entire meal. And because of that, we value that meal so much more. And also the fact that we're not just physical beings. We're emotional, we're spiritual, and all the the so-called neurons that are, are fired up from both our spiritual and emotional interactions when, when we're, we're making something together, those impact our taste buds. And so we actually think the meal tastes 10 times better than that two-star Michelin restaurant we <laughs> right. could have gone to instead. Because I have my hands in it, damn it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's, there's so much more. Obviously, you have seven different tactics and uses of tactics to apply friction in these very helpful ways. And we just touched on one meaning, but before we go, I want to ask you about something that I found really poignant at the beginning of your book, which is, you know, better than most that we're all through this use of avoiding friction. We're trying to avoid stress, right? You hear about having a less stressful day and about getting rid of stress in our life. And we don't want stress. And you actually make the point that stress, if applied correctly, is something soon that we may really actually want. Yeah, I I think just like friction, it it is equated to stress. And we think all stress is bad. And there's probably a lot of bad stress, I would say for sure. But there's probably a lot of good stresses. And we shouldn't try to – it's just like conflict resolution is a very simple example of that, right? When you're talking conflict resolution, the goal isn't to avoid the conflict. The goal is actually to surface a conflict in an environment where people feel safe to do so, right? And that's the key. If you don't put it in a safe environment, then obviously the conflict and trying to resolve it then becomes counterproductive and quite frankly can be very destructive. I think the same thing is with stress. You need to frame it in a way. If you're overstressed already and you just 
add in another piece of stress, you have no way to compartmentalize or contextualize what is about to happen to you and you're not prepared for it. And so your body automatically just rejects any stress that's added in, whether it's good or bad stress. I mean, think about the stress, you know, and I'm thinking about it now. My son's 12. I'm going to have to talk about the birds and the bees. I don't think it's something that anyone goes, ah, I can't wait to do that, right? You got to think about it. You got to, you know, you got you to you like, uh, you know, what am I going to say? What if he says this or asks this question? I mean, it's not like a stress-free thing. But I actually, if I mentally prepare myself and I put it in the right context of this is not only, you know, something I want to do as a father, But this is something I want to pass on to him so that he and I have a better relationship. So when it comes to the time when he's dating and and things, you know, he's faced with what's called dilemmas or or questions, he feels like there's a safe place for him to come to have a conversation with me about. And if I think about it in that context, I think it's actually – it's a very positive stress. Um, And obviously I have to be in the right frame of mind and, and find the right time to do it. But it is an important stress in your life that you need to do. And I think it's true for exercise. Like if you were already too fatigued, tired, and you had a bad back and you said, look, I have to go do my one-hour workout, it may not be the best time for you, right? And and so, again, I think this idea that you need to introduce the good stresses in your life and you have to do it within the right context and you have to be intentional about it. I think the key here is you can't just randomly say all stress are good or bad. It's the idea you do have to think about there are times when I want to introduce good stress into my life and I want to at least create the right environment for that. I love that idea of being intentional. And I think that ex- that is all over this work. The book is called Friction, Adding Value by Making People Work for It. And I'm assuming soon it is available everywhere. Yeah, it's on Amazon, Barnes, whatever you want. But yes. Yes, and I, it does lay out some strategies both on a personal level, on a building a great team or work environment level, and obvious in terms of building fantastic brands that people yeah. literally fall in love with. Just like, you know, love is a certain type of friction. And, and so how do you make sure people, you're not a forgettable brand just because you're so easy to both acquire but also easy to forget? Boy, I, and I love your discussion on exclusivity. I mean, I could have spent just a 45 minutes talking exclusivity because that is, that is <laughs> phenomenal right there. Making things more exclusive is an amazing way to apply some friction. Thank you so much for talking friction with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. Hey, this is John in Seattle. And when I'm not telling terrible dad jokes to anyone who will listen, I'm Stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Soon Yu for coming down to the basement. Oh, gee, I like this because our houses are filled with stuff that we don't need. And increasingly, it's so easy to buy things. Go, oh, I'll just buy that. I'll take it home. But if you delay, if you apply some friction, maybe you'll spend less money, have more enjoyment. I mean, there's all these benefits. I definitely need to have a little bit more friction in my buying experiences. <laughs> <laughs> I do not have. No, what, what you need is delayed gratification. You haven't delayed a damn thing. I, in I, like 15 I, years. I, that's not true. Not 15. No, maybe five. Okay. Delayed gratification is more than 17 minutes, OG. He says some gratification delayed from him. Yes. Right? <laughs> that's true. Also. Wasn't necessarily his choice to delay. But uh, yeah, enough on that. Big thanks to Soon You. So much to look at when we think about how do we put these walls sometimes between us and things. And they can be they can be good walls. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, Doug, they put what you value first. Hold on. I'm never ready for this question. Just give me a minute. Haven Lifeline. I got to pull up. I've got a whole database of Haven Lifeline responses that are completely ad. They're totally ad-libbed. Don't. OG, what do you value? No, I was just getting there. But OG, what do you value? Go ahead, Doug. No. You've, you've got your list. I mean, your totally ad-libbed list. My totally ad-libbed list that nobody would ever know that has been planned out. Like, how about focusing the world's great scientists and technologists on making an electric razor that shaves as close as a blade? That's what I care about most. Oh, there it is. You spend a lot more time on that when you're not filling out insurance policy applications at Haven Life. They're 
application process is easy. It's been simplified, streamlined. It's all online. You get an instant coverage decision in most cases. No waiting around. Lovely customer support. Head to stackingbenjamins.com slash havenlife for more. Time to get your life insurance in order, people. Good time to do that is today. Today, we're going to throw out the lifeline to Jake. Say hi, Jake. Hey, Joe, OG, and I guess neighbor Doug, too. My mom just received an inheritance from the passing of a family member. In addition to a cash gift for each of my siblings and me, she's expressed interest in buying a piece of land that we choose for each of us and putting our names on the respective titles. She believes that right now, buying land is one of the best things to invest in. And I do kind of like the idea of co-owning a piece of land that I could build a house on in the future. Should I just do proper research to choose a property or should I ask her to consider an alternative investment vehicle? A third option exists in which that money is used to open a Sizzler franchise in our neck of the woods. I know that this is her inheritance to do with how she pleases, and I'm grateful that she's considering us, but I don't want her to make a bad decision. I think I know what your answer will be, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on it anyway, maybe even an OG rant if I'm lucky. The other listener says you don't teach them anything, but if I've learned anything from you, it's... Anyways, my shirt size is an extra <laughs> medium, but you don't care about that. See you. I was waiting for it. I was waiting for it, Jake. Nice, nice pull there. Man, how do you do that? How do you, uh, you know, mom wants to give you money. She wants it to be land. Do you fight her on it? I think the hardest thing out of all of this is just the gift part of it. The money gift is fine, right? So there's gifting rules. You can give $16,000 a year a person. Uh, above that, and you run into some gift issues that you got to be aware of and work with a CPA or an, uh, an estate planning attorney about uh, how to uh, navigate. Um, but I'm assuming that the piece of land that is going to get purchased for you is going to be more than sixteen grand. So how are you going to get that? Is, is I'm just going to buy it and then sell it to you for a dollar, the proverbial quit claim deed for a buck. Well, that's fine. Then becomes in, it's in your name. That's fine. The downside of course is then you, your cost basis on this property is a buck. So whatever you do from that point forward, you know, it's going to be capital gains. You know, you can kind of delay that again too, right? If it becomes a home and you know, you can exclude the, the capital gain of a primary residence and so on and so forth. You follow those rules. But I think you would want to research that a little bit more or work with somebody who can kind of unpack all of those different things. Because the last thing that you want to do is, you, is, is have mom spend all this money and then get a tax bill at the end of the year for 50 grand or some, some insane number. And she's like, well, I don't have any of the money left. I just gave it all to my kids or I split it up and I only have 50 grand left and now I got to pay that in taxes. And that's like we were talking about the social security piece. Like those are those unforeseen dominoes that fall down the line, you know, 10 steps later that somebody has to kind of walk you through a little bit. As far as like land or investment vehicles or whatever, I would just be grateful for any sort of gift, regardless of what it is. And if it happens to be a piece of property that uh, is something that is exciting for you and for your for your family to, you know, to build on in the future. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. I like it too. And I can't think of any good that would come out of fighting your mom on what vehicle she wants to give you this money by. I think that would be, that would be really awkward. Yeah. I mean, let's say that you already owned 150,000 acres and you're like, I don't need another five acres, mom. I already got enough. Like that's, you know, that's a different thing altogether. But if it's like, hey, we're all, you know, there's this development that's happening and we all can buy like, you know, we're going to go buy five lots and then, you know, as we're able to, we can build cottages in the woods and we can all have this family time or something, you know, that would be super awesome. Or you guys are spread out all over the place and she's like, just find some property and I will spring for it. And, you know, what you guys do with it after that is up to you. You know, there's all sorts of good that can come from it. But I wouldn't be like, oh, I want to take it in a REIT, mom. So so send me a Vanguard account or something like that. That's just kind of tacky. So get what you get and you don't pitch a fit, right? Yes. It's like we tell the kids. It's like you at a restaurant. Yeah. Order what you want. Eat what you get. 100% of the time. 
I do. I never complain at restaurants. Because you're terrified of somebody spitting in your food. I am very terrified of that. Yes, I am actually. They might have, that might happen anyway. You know, there might be no no discernment between like <laughs> complaining or not complaining, but <laughs> you know, just just general demeanor like warrants a spitting. <laughs> Regardless, like that guy gets his food spit in, <laughs> even if he doesn't complain. Table fifty three. Yeah, yeah, just the bacon cheeseburger. Everybody else is cool, but that guy, that glutton that's eating the bacon cheeseburger with the chili cheese fries, is already four beers down and two mudslides. Yeah, that dude's getting some stuff spit on. You know, he got here early, waiting for his friends at three o five for not dinner. That he's thought through this scenario or anything. I was gonna say that is oddly specific. Oddly specific. <laughs> oddly specific. Yeah, I've got a table of four, but you know what? They're running a little tardy, so I'm gonna sit at the bar for a quick minute. Are you guys meeting for like a late lunch? Oh no, it's dinner. They'll be here like about six. So, so it's three o five. Like, do you want to argue with me, or do you want me to start spending money at the bar? <laughs> OG travels with food <laughs> tasters. <laughs> so, don't have mom spit in your land. Just take what mom <laughs> yes. gives you. Be good that's with right. it. That's right. Mom gives you land, don't spit in it. That's. I think that's the takeaway of this entire episode. Isn't that next a Game time of Jake, Thrones episode? Next time Jake calls in, he doesn't have to have the blank space at the end now. He can fill sure. it in with don't uh, spit on mom's land. Uh, <laughs> thanks to Jake for calling in. By the way, we always uh, have a few fewer questions during the summer. So if you want to go closer to the head of the class, I know sometimes it takes us a few weeks to get to your question, but if you want to go very quickly, stackofbenjamins.com slash voicemail. If you've got a burning question, we'd uh, love to answer it. And if you're like Jake, who wears an extra schmedium from State Farm, how do we miss that? Jake from State Farm. Yes. Duh. Dang. It's a little late now, but totally miss that. Yes. I bet you no one's ever called him that. What are you wearing, Jake? <sighs> He's wearing the Stacking Benjamin shirt, of course, that he just got for calling in the uh, Haven Life Stacking Benjamin's t-shirt. Cha. <laughs> like we all do. Oh, sure, Jake. I bet you are. Stackingbenjamins.com slash voicemail. Hey, uh, during the summer, because we have lots of vacations, we will often do more evergreen shows. And so there is obviously a lot going on in the news and some of it we won't cover here on the show. However, we will cover it on our Instagram channel. We have Instagram lives. We try to make sure that we keep up with, with current events as much as we can, but we also know that good financial planning is much more about fundamentals. So during the summer, this summer where we're getting so much bumpy news, um, you might want to make sure you follow us on Instagram, Stacking Benjamin's podcast, or also, our 201 newsletter, we always dive in more there. StackyBenjamins.com slash 201 for that. The number 201. Brooke Miller does such a great job putting that together. And by the way, thank you for all the people that have written to us uh, telling us how much better our newsletter has gotten than a year ago. Yes, I would not be bragging about our newsletter 12 months ago, but it is so good. Last but not least, if you are somebody who needs to dream bigger about your personal financial planning and you need a better team, OG and his team are taking new clients. So head to stackybenjamins.com slash OG. And that is their calendar and the first step into making better investment decisions. All right. That's going to do it for today. Doug, I think you got it from your man. What should we have learned today? Well, Joe, first, listen to Soon You. Friction in your life might just make things better when applied to the right places. Second, HR is not necessarily your friend. Make sure to advocate for the best salary you can. But the big lesson, participation trophy? Yeah, no, there's not a participation trophy for listening to this. The fact that you get to hear the dulcet tones of my voice, isn't that enough of an award? Thanks to Soon Yu for joining us today. His book, Friction, is available anywhere it makes you feel accomplished to shop. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2022, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch, with help from Joe, me, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. 
After you listen to our show, check out the 201 Deep Dives, written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So, say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. Both she and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. Not only should you not take advice from these dorks, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist today. You get to take part in a uh, stacking Benjamin's team meeting as part of the after show, because no? I had for the first time hard pass. Thanks. In quite a while. Unsubscribe. Oh, she doesn't participate in the real team meetings. It's like, I don't want, I don't want anything to do with the team meeting. I had a money hiccup. That's pretty damn funny. And the funny thing is, is that, uh, well, let me tell you the story. OG is looking at a new bank for us. We're looking to, to move money to a new bank. What is incredibly funny to me is the person we're dealing with at the new bank, I feel like, is the, um, what is that, the... Um, Antichrist? No, no, the, uh, the business, not development, what's the opposite of development? Business development, the business, uh, the like, we're going to do less business expert <laughs> we're gonna do less business i haven't expert? had any trouble with the bank so i'm not gonna bad mouth them the business rejection people you could you could bad mouth them all you want L- listen to i've this. not had an issue with them this is the person that's allergic to money <laughs> apparently allergic to bringing business to the bank i have relationships currently with three different banks all fantastic relationships things going great right I have uh, multiple brokerage accounts. I have retirement accounts and we're signing up for the new bank. And I find out, Doug, I find out from the banker that I have been rejected on this checking account that I can't get on the, on the business checking account. They looked at your history, didn't they, Joe? <laughs> they, they did. Internet search history is what they looked they at. They did. It is awesome. The guy's like, hey, uh, we can't have you on this account because uh, because of what check system said about you. I'm like, what did he's like? Yeah, I can't tell you, but you can go look it up yourself. So he knows he knows what the issue is. I don't know what the issue well, is. Well, And truthfully, I, I when he texted me that I said, is it something that would is it just uh, your bank issue or is it something that is likely to be an every bank issue? Because if it's an every bank issue, then whatever. If it's a your bank issue. F off. We'll just go to a different bank. Had drinks this weekend with my local banker is one of my best friends who is the bank that the one of the three banks that I deal with. Thanks, Joe. He's, I'm sitting right here. But OK, he's like your best friends. Go he's ahead. like, well, my other best friend, my other okay. best friend. And Robert's like, yeah, that shouldn't be an issue. And it is a joke. So I have to go to check systems because he can't tell me. 
I dig into check systems, says everything's current and fine, except for a credit union that my kid had in college. In 2017, when they left college, they did not close the account. The account had fees, and then the account continually was uh, going into overdraft, apparently, to the tune of, get this, get this, this is why I can't be on the account, $14 that my kid had at their university credit union account in 2017 is why I can't be on the account. Of course, I had a fantastic discussion with my kid after that. But by the way, this also gets to co-signing, right? When you co-sign anything, you co-sign stuff. It's a good time. <laughs> my, my, how the turntables. I, I think it's, I think it's so amazing. $14 and this dude won't take my business. I think we I, should continue with this bank. This is why, this is why I think we should use this. Pay your $14 we off. We should do, use this bank. If I knew my kid had a $14 thing, number one, number two is it's from 2017. Number three is I've got three open bank relationships right now. Okay. An open relationship? I do. Apparently I do because we're going to swing with this fourth bank. I just think it's sad that you're pawning this off on your kid. Like you can't just own <laughs> the issue yourself. Yeah. I mean, that's just, that's, that just, I mean, Oh, I'm a moderately well-known financial expert to even the 11 it, people that listen to me on the interweb. Even if it was, I can't have a bad reputation. It's my, uh, my, uh, uh, my son's <laughs> fault. Yes. Cause he bought a bit of honey on credit. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you pay yeah. the $14 off? Why does my kid pay the $14 off? But at today's interest rates, no, it's no, going to no, be no. really expensive. No, no. Let's make this about what it's about, though. Very, very seriously. 2017, $14. I get no. it, man. Like, no. Like, no, 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 my no, no, sister no, no, no. Has like we, a- we can't do business with you, dude. We can't do business with you. Because you got that 14 bucks from the University of Texas Federal Credit Union. Are you trying to do like therapy on the internet? You open, everybody's going to pat you on the back and say, it's okay, Joe. No. I believe that you're not a criminal. That's not it at all, Doug. Just a couple things for everybody out there. Number one, watch out what you co-sign. Oh, gee, we've said it a hundred times. Don't co-sign anything ever. Watch out what you co-sign, right? Which is why I'm trying to get Joe off the bank account. (laughs) (laughs) I've successfully figured it out finally. (laughs) 